Well, is summer back? It's hard to tell. Seems like the heat goes on vacation, and then it returns, and then it thought it might make one quick trip out before school starts again. I don't know. So many of you have been traveling as well, seeing some cool places, dodging the heat that was here, then the cold. Some of you go to places like Paris, Rome, bustling cities. Others of you try to find the off-beaten path, a little less hustle and bustle, right? That's kind of my speed. And some of you are trying to find places that are really out of the way. So one family in this congregation, well, they just went fly fishing. How was it? Too much rain. How many in here like to fish? Serious? Okay, so we're beginning a series on Go Fish. Little part of me wanted to bring in Brad Paisley's song, but I thought, better not. If you know it, you know it's going through your mind right now, and you're welcome. If you don't, probably, probably better that I didn't bring it up. So anyway, I grew up around lakes. I grew up in, in Michigan. I was surrounded, literally, by lakes. And people in my family, they liked to fish, and relatives liked to fish, and friends liked to fish, and I didn't really like to fish, but I went with them, you know? And I, I was a little bit intimidated sometimes. I would, I'd be with people who know what they're doing, and here I'm just wildly casting a line or doing whatever, and I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Nobody ever taught me. And I would be around people that pull one fish in after another, and I'm like, my gosh. I didn't like grabbing hold of bait. I didn't like that on my hands. And Lord have mercy, if we have to clean these things, I don't want to be a part of that. That is disgusting. So I don't know how many have tried fishing and decided it's not for you. Okay. Very good. So years ago, I was in... I was in tech school. It's kind of where I met Kathy. We're a tech school romance decades later. And I had this roommate, and this roommate, he was a fisherman. In fact, if you said the word that's all you had to say. You begin with an F, and all of a sudden, like a cartoon, he's there with his fishing hat, pole in hand, tackle in the other, ready to go. I'm like, what are you doing, man? He loved it. And I went out with him. He took me fishing, and we were in Texas, of all places. I mean, is Texas known for lakes? I don't know. But he taught me about catfishing and stink bait and all this stuff. Whatever a fish likes, that's what he was showing me. And so we were out there throwing a line in the water time after time, sitting at this lake. I mean, nothing was biting. I don't know what was going on. All of a sudden, this four by four pickup truck starts driving into the lake and got to the middle without it getting up to the doors. And then we realized, gosh, this two mile lake is shallow. There, it's too hot, there's no fish in here. But even though I didn't care much for fishing, it was something about my friend John. His enthusiasm drew me in and I was into it. It was something amazing. I enjoyed going because of him. He was so into it. He had a watch that showed him if it was good fishing weather or not. Like weather like this, good fishing weather. And he was like, oh, yep, time to go. And I would go with him and I would imagine what it would be like to reel in a big one. I, I was trying. A couple of years ago, I was working in a hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina, and one of our contractors, he started talking about fishing. This was a guy that I worked with regularly, and he was kind of working under me. And this guy loved to fish. I mean, he was serious. This was almost semi-pro fisherman. 
This guy would enter into competitions where they would have to pay money to try. And the purse for winning was huge. And he would tell all of his stories. And this, you know the guy, he's got this funny tan line in the shape of sunglasses where he's white here and brown everywhere else. And he would tell about the boats that they were on and these beautiful bodies of water. And I was amazed. It was, it was pretty cool. He was all into it. And I started thinking, well, maybe fishing wouldn't be so bad. He's talking about thousands of dollars won. I'm like, sweet. Big boats and going places. And who cares about the fish? My gosh. But today we're starting this series. It's a mini series. It's two Sundays long. And it ends up in three weeks on a lake, no less, at a combined community worship service. But we're going to dive in at Luke chapter 5. And we're going to look at some fishermen in Scripture. It begins in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's also known as Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. You see, pushing, being in the boat and pushing it away a little bit, the people weren't going to stand in the water and crowd him. Consequently, if you have an ant problem in your kitchen and and they're after your honey bottle, you can set it in a saucer of water and it works just the same. Just note to self. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Why the reaction from Peter in verse 8? What happened? It says there that when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. What was going on there? See, Peter was a professional. This is his vocation, his job. This is how he fed his family. Not the fish per se, but the money acquired from selling the fish that he brought in. And as a professional, he looked at this situation and knew that this catch was extraordinary or extraordinary. Jesus was obviously more than a carpenter. There was this revelation of the divine that took place in that moment. And Peter had already seen this same Jesus in action. In chapter 4, Jesus and Peter were interacting. In fact, Jesus was at a synagogue, and a man possessed with a demon began to speak and to reveal who Jesus was prematurely. And Jesus rebuked the demon, delivered the man from that oppression. Peter was amongst the crowd at the synagogue. Jesus then went over to Peter's house for a meal. Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus prayed for her. She became well and began to attend them and serve them. Other people came bringing their sick and were healed. This is what Peter observed in this Jesus. This guy from Nazareth, this carpenter, 
There was something amazing going on in him. So when he saw all of those things happening, and then Jesus instructs him on how to fish, and he sees what takes place, he's suddenly struck that he's standing in the presence of none other than God himself. The contrast between Jesus and Peter was what got to him. I spoke about contrast in this last series. We begin to see things so clearly because of contrast. When everything's the same, it's not differentiated. But when there's contrast, oh my, do we see. And this is what happened with Peter. He could see himself reflected off of Jesus. And what he saw, he didn't like. He was ashamed to be in the presence of God himself. Peter was suddenly aware of his own sin and failings. But notice what, what happens. Peter's sudden apprehension was not met with Jesus' rejection, but with acceptance and with vision for the future. Jesus came for those just like Peter, and we are just like him. And sometimes when we stand next to God, and we have those moments where his presence is so tangible, suddenly we're aware of ourselves. And sometimes it's hard to accept that the God of the universe who created everything, including us, that he sees me, that he knows me, even the ugly things, and that he still cares about me personally. And Jesus' care and concern is the same for you. And Jesus' call to Peter is the same for you. Let down the nets. And I will make you fishers of people. Jesus instructed Peter to do something. Something very familiar, wasn't it? To fish. But when he was asked to fish... He was immediately faced with a decision to obey or not. Remember, Peter had fished all night. If you can imagine this, they get up like a baker, two in the morning. They start gathering equipment. They're prepping the boats. They're getting it all in. They know that when the fish start biting, they need to already be on point, in the place where the fish will be, throwing the nets, or however else they're catching the fish. This is where they need to be. So they've spent the entire night fishing, and he does this day in and day out. This is what he does. He's a fisherman. And Jesus asks him to put out into deep water and to throw out again, to drag that line, to find the fish. And Jesus is like, we've been at it all night. I mean, Peter said that. So when Jesus asked him to, to do this, it was a decision that wasn't based in logic or the natural. And so many times God will speak to us and it doesn't line up with logic or our sense of what should be. God speaks. He is got something amazing that's about to take place if we will respond to the call. It's just waiting to be experienced. So Peter is faced with this decision, do I obey or not? Peter was faced with a crisis of belief. And you too face the same crisis of belief when God instructs you to do something. What goes through your mind when God speaks to you this way? Did I hear correctly? Who said that? Was that God? Was that Satan? Was that the pizza I ate last night talking? What is that? Or what if I'm wrong? What if I missed it? What are the implications? Jesus wasn't just calling Peter. Although Peter had 
an additional calling to be an apostle, he was first called to be a disciple like you. And disciples are expected to reach people and to keep on reaching people in a perpetual sense. This is what we do as disciples. When Jesus calls to each one of us and he says the same words, come, follow me. We pattern and mimic after the master. It's an apprenticeship that leads to a different role where we are continually doing what we see him doing. And Jesus himself said he does nothing of his own but what he sees the Father doing. And so our job is to become, well, little Christ, so to speak. Not to become God, but, but to be just like him in so many ways. We are to reach people. And you might, thinking, might be thinking, who, me? No, I'm not an evangelist. That's not my gift. Or I'm an introvert. Some of you, it's like, I don't even like people. I get you. We do this Sunday after Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, and I'm an introvert, all right? So that's not an excuse. Pull that one out of your bag and throw it away. Because an introvert just means you get your batteries charged by being alone. It doesn't mean you're incapable of talking to people. Go get your batteries charged, talk to people, get spent, go back and recharge, and keep repeating, right? This is what I do, man. I get done with Sunday, and I turn to stone when I get in the car. And everybody goes, well, you want to go out to eat? Or places like the mall? I'm like, no. <laughs> we might see some of them there. <laughs> <sighs> But I come here Sunday after Sunday because you're worth it. <laughs> no, honestly. I just, I know my capacity. But my point is this, is even if you're an introvert, you got no excuse. This is the calling. This is what it is for each, each and every one of us. We are called to fish. We are called to do like Jesus. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we have one of the five occurrences of this great commission that is upon every believer, every disciple, every follower of Jesus from the ones that heard it personally with their own ears through today and beyond. This is <clears throat> one of five, the first five books of the New Testament have an occurrence where they're giving us this idea, this commandment. Mark 16, 15, he says to them, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. In John 20, verse 21, again Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And the other passages are found in Matthew 28, Luke 24, and Acts 1. So, if we are called to fish, what does that look like? Marcus, I, I missed my point way back. My point, you probably passed through it. Point number one was Jesus wants you to fish for people. Covered. Covered. Point number two, Jesus wants you to know what fishing is. For Peter, fishing consisted of preparing the nets, throwing them out, dragging them back in, or dragging them behind his boat. I remember when we were stationed in Biloxi, Mississippi at Keesler Air Force Base, out in the Gulf, and in, in Mississippi, it's a dirty, dirty Gulf water, it's kind of nasty because of barrier islands that prevent the, the outflow of the, of the Mississippi River from making its way. It just kind of sits there. But beyond those barrier waters, barrier islands, you have all these shrimp boats out there. And the shrimp boats are pretty cool. If you've seen Forrest Gump, you know what I'm talking about. It has these arms that hold a net, and the arms flop out on either side of the boat and drag a big net behind and catch 
what they may. And then they pull in the net and they sort everything. And we would go down to the dock and we would find, and it was typically Vietnamese people who were fishing. And they would come up and they would have the shrimp already sorted, large, medium, small. And we would go up and we would ask for a certain amount of fish of a particular, I mean shrimp of a particular size. They'd bag it, pay for it, and it would be like at least one fourth of the price of the grocery store across the street selling the same shrimp. And it was fun. We just had to clean them a little bit. And I didn't mind cleaning shrimp. Fish, that's another matter, but shrimp were great. And so this is kind of how it was for Peter. They would go out onto the lake, they would drag the nets, they would pull in, they would sort, they would sell what they had. And today we have plenty of ways of catching fish, right? Pole and line, we have nets, some people use them. I see mostly people standing on a, on a shoreline throwing a net and it has weights around the outside and then they try to surprise a fish from above, you know, and pull it in. And then there's people with spears. Anybody ever try a spear fishing? Were you underwater? See, that's awesome. Fishing underwater with scuba gear. No? Free dive. Aqua lung. <laughs> How about jugging? You know what that is? It's not legal everywhere. It's where you get an old, old jug plastic jug, maybe bleach came in it, maybe soap, whatever, and you anchor it to the ground, but you also tie a line with a hook and some bait, and you just plop it down, leave it, and walk away. You come back another day. You can put about eight of these around, and you come back and you find what you have, and, and the jug acts like a bobber, and it's bobbing up and down and bringing in what could be a good meal. And then... How about this? Do you know what noodling is? Have you heard about this? Oh, this is insane. <laughs> Who's ever tried it? Dave. I remember hearing some old men talk about pulling in catfish that were so big that they couldn't get them up the hill where their car was parked. Catfish that big and here's what they do they they stick they find a hole where the catfish has embedded itself and they stick their arm or their leg or their fingers in and let the thing bite them and then pull it out by its tonsils and drag it up to shore a hungry person discovered this tactic, <laughs> right? You've seen Survivor? No line needed, no hook. You just go in and grab them. This is insane. Maybe they jellyfish the same way. <laughs> I have seen many ways of fishing, but that one that is just insane. Now, fishing is a metaphor. It's applied here to the idea of leading people to Jesus. And metaphors have their limitations, especially when we stretch them too far. Because when we start talking about cleaning fish, well, now that might be getting a little too far. But metaphors also have great utility in that they convey a spiritual truth with a natural understanding. And, th and Jesus used them all the time. Peter and his crew fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus had them let down their nets again. The action was the same. No different. It was the same action, but with differing results. And the result was God was involved in one of the two occurrences. God made something happen. And the act of fishing the same act, letting down the nets, the same act is what I call input. This is where we have control. 
God speaks to you. He says, do something. You have a crisis of belief, working it out in your head and heart. Is this God? Should I? Shouldn't I? And then when you act upon it, that is input. Whatever it is God told you to do, input. We do not control output. That's God's department. But our department is input. We do what we can, and the results are God's. Input versus output. And fishing is the act of attempting to catch fish or people. It requires forethought and it requires intentionality. We don't just accidentally catch fish. Now, I have heard of fish jumping into a boat. I ain't never seen it. I have no idea about that. That seems sweet, but in my experience, you have to be intentional. You have to understand the fish, bring the right stuff, be there at the right time, and have somebody that's a worse fisherman than you in the boat so that you will catch a fish. To fish for people means that you will initiate conversations, that you will throw your line out, that you will dangle bait, and you will see if they bite. Fishing is a skill that can be acquired and developed. Peter had only become a professional because he'd learned and applied the tricks of the trade over a period of time. It was repetition. Other skills we try to learn are born through repetition. This is how they happen. We, there's some idea of mastery. Somebody said 10,000 hours is where you really have mastered something. That's a lot of hours. And you know, I see some of you all putting kids into sports at like preschool, and you've got in your mind a vision of what will be when they turn 18, 19, 20, right? You picture them professional with their name on a jersey, and you've got them going. But you know what? Sometimes there's a lot of truth to some of this stuff. Talent factors in, but the hours and the input. Even somebody who's mediocre in ability will outpace everybody else because of the hours and time spent. Even those that have natural talent. Just the same, fishing for people requires intentionality. It requires trial and error. It requires refinement of technique. It requires learning from others who are better at it. It requires being in the right spot at the right time, throwing the line out, and seeing if you get a nibble. And then it's learning how to reel them in without losing them. Very important. And here's the thing. The fish come unwillingly. People, though, when they're brought to Christ, they realize not the end of what was, but the beginning of what should have been and what could be. It's a different thing that's going on. When we are bringing people to Christ, when we are bringing them toward our family and wanting to include them, it's a positive. Because let's face it, everybody on planet Earth, and you're fish too, we all are the same. We all have the same worries and concerns and fears. And life in one country is pretty much the same in another country. Parents worry about kids and kids ignore parents and then they do their own thing. And everybody's worried about how to feed their family and, and put bread on the table. They're worried about the same stuff. We can talk to anybody on the planet because we get them if we'll just remember that. Now, knowing who and what about fishing are important, but now Jesus wants you to know why you are called to fish. God's plan from the beginning was to send Jesus to this sinful planet to do two primary things. One, he would become the way of salvation, that perfect substitute for our punishment. He's the only one that qualified by being perfect, but he was able and willing to step in and take the punishment for our sins that we deserved. He volunteered for that job. Imagine. 
so that we could have life, so that justice could be served and we're set free, both. But then secondly, he came not only to become the way of salvation, but to build the means of salvation, and that being the church. And it began with that shoreline occurrence where he met up with Peter and three others that would become apostles and attracting a crowd. And he called to them and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And then he gives that great commission and it transfers down through the ages. But imagine, when Satan saw Jesus hanging on a Roman cross, nearing death, taking those labored breaths, almost to the point where he says, it is finished. And the devil's looking at him and thought he had won. Even when Jesus breathed out his last breath and died, Satan was ready for that victory dance. But then the same spirit who later raised Jesus from the dead, that same spirit is the one who's also poured out, being poured out into your life, into my life, enabling us to be effective witnesses of Jesus that we tell others about him and how we've interacted with him and how that's changed our life. Now imagine Satan's shock to discover that his attack on the one now resulted in the multiplication of testimony about Jesus from many. I imagine he was looking at the cross, at Jesus, looking at what he perceived as victory, and then all of a sudden, one over here is testifying, one over there is testifying, and Satan's becoming disturbed, looking around as time and again, one after another, throughout Jerusalem, are calling people to faith in Jesus, the one that he just destroyed. I imagine Satan being pretty disturbed. This was the plan, always has been. This was the mystery that Paul talked about in Ephesians. The mystery revealed that all along God has planned to redeem people and bring them into his family from every tribe and language and nation. This was the plan all along, and it includes you. Somehow you came to faith or are coming to faith. And it was somebody's involvement in your life speaking to you that has encouraged you to trust also in this same Jesus. And God wants to use you. I mean, we're all wondering all the time. We come up in this life as kids and we want to know what is our contribution to society? Where do we fit in? What is it that makes my life in particular valuable in this context? And will anybody even have benefited from my life here on earth? And the answer is, if you plug in to God's plan for you, it includes you being a part of his overall plan for humanity. And when you allow him to fill you with his Holy Spirit to speak through you, even though you might have cast a line a few times, oh, he's got something big planned. A catch, something that will be an eternal, eternally significant situation for someone else where they're brought to faith. It's amazing. And you need to understand God has called you. He's called you to fish for opportunities to share the good news, the good news that has changed your life. And God has placed you in a context of history. You were born at just the right time. Into the right place, into the right family, no matter how screwed up. And God has foreseen and predestined that you would be a part of his plan. He has destined you to be a part of something amazing. 
for such a time as this, to influence people in the spheres of influence that God has opened up to you. And if you think about where you are and where you were, they're not the same. And God has shown you amazing things and taken you to amazing places and put you around people. And around you are people without hope, fearful, who don't have a sense of where they're going or how to live life. And you are put there by God's design. Each of us have unique opportunities to fish, but we don't do it alone. Like Peter, we share the responsibility with our partners, our companions, our family. As Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, one plants, one plants the seed, another waters it, and God makes it grow unto harvest. So this is the first of two messages in a short series. Today I covered who, what, and why of our call to go fish. Guess what's next week? When, where, how. When, where, and how. And how is really an important piece because this is the thing that trips people up. We don't know what to say to people or how to say it or how to start or how to finish. And so hopefully, God willing, I'll have a good answer for you next week. Jobert, I want to ask you to come. I might be doing pretty good for time. It's not like an hour message today. Play something dreamy, please. Bring in that spiritual sense. Is it muggy in here? You feeling it? So what's your response to this? If you haven't yet responded to Jesus' first call, his first call, the universal call to all of us to come and follow him, if you haven't yet responded to Jesus' first call that leads you to salvation in him, well, that's, that's where you need to begin. And now's the time. It's like this. We trust in him, putting our faith in him. And we are saved. It's too simple. Should be harder. We should have to work for this, it seems, but that's not really the case. It's a very simple matter. We make a volitional choice, choosing to trust in him and making him in our heart, Lord master of our lives and we yield ourselves submitting to him allowing him to lead us because it's an amazing thing sometimes we think we know what we're doing but when we realize that he's the ancient of days that he preceded time itself and created everything it makes and he's kind and loving it makes it easy to trust him he knows what he's talking about. He knows how he formed us. And he knows the plan that he has for us. And he just wants to include us in that. You begin by trusting in Jesus. Now is the time. I'm not calling you down the front. I'm not going to lay hands. You are not going to shed tears and do all that. But you make a, a decision. Trust in him of your own free will, commit yourself to his way, follow him. Now, if you've done that already, if you've already come to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord, then you need to respond to your Lord's instruction to let down your nets for a catch and to do that daily to open your eyes, to recognize that he's working around you in the lives of the people that you keep passing. It's not the stranger on the street that you cold call, walking up to them and ask them where they're going for eternity. 
It's the coworker, the relative, the neighbor, the people that you have repeated exposure to. It begins with friendship and kindness and then moves on from there. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to earth. You had heaven, and then you came down to where we were, to our level. You came at just the right time, at a point in history that made it perfect for your good news to be proclaimed throughout the world from one generation to the next. Jesus, I thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. I thank you that I have opportunity for life eternal in you. Thank you for that. God, I pray for those that are still on the fence deciding whether to trust in you as Lord or not. Encourage them. Give them trust. Give them faith. Help them to receive your grace. And show them a vision, your vision, of their possible and preferable future. God, I pray that you would help all of us to commit our ways to you. And I pray that we would be able to work with you, open our eyes to see what you're doing in the lives of people around us and help us to overcome fear of witnessing to others, even in the workplace. God, I pray that you would make us as cunning as serpents, but innocent as doves. Help us to do what you've called us to do, even in hostile environments. God, I pray, show us how. In Jesus' name, amen.